Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about refactoring without causing regressions. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, Frederick, what techniques do you have for ensuring that refactors won't break legacy code? Well, uh, oh, there, the code doesn't have any unit tests. Okay, yes, okay, so we don't have any unit tests and you want to refactor without breaking the code. Okay, uh, I have a few tips and tricks that I can give you, so I have two main ways of doing this. And basically the way th that I usually do it is that I approach the problem from two sides. I go at it from the top level and from the bottom up at the same time. All right, I'm actually doing that right now. So I can give you a small story. Uh, I started working on this project, which was handed to me as a secondhand code base, which was basically a hackathon. And the idea was that I would take over ownership of this code base, and then they were going to build a team. Uh, well, basically, I'm going to train a team. I'm going to teach uh, like a few juniors and a few mid-levels, etc., etc., all the things, and then we're going to raise this up to a corporate level, full-fledged system that can scale to like. I don't know what size. I'm assuming one of the largest systems uh, that the company has, right? Now, when I was handed this code base, uh, there were no tests whatsoever, none. And everything was, well, it was TypeScript, but there were no, no, the strict rule wasn't applied. So like the type system was completely pointless. Everything was basically JavaScript. And it was, of course, built by someone who, well, had their own style of making projects and stuff like that. So there were a lot of issues, right? Now, in that situation, as you are describing, I need to somehow fix this. But since I haven't been part, and of course that person isn't around, so I can't ask how things are supposed to work, then there's really no way for me to fix that without potentially breaking something. And so the first thing I do is to connect with my stakeholders and I say the my biggest suggestion right now is that we invest in end-to-end -end testing. So the reason why I suggested that was very simple because the first thing I want to make sure is that if I'm going to touch a bunch of features then I have to know how the feature was intended to work. And this is a new system to me. I haven't used this system. I don't know of all the features. And by si simply suggesting that we're going to have to write down a suite of end-to-end -end tests, like my favorite style of working is BDD when it comes to this sort of stuff. So using something like Cucumber or similar sorts of things is a very good investment in creating feature files. And so that's the first thing we did, or rather that's the first thing I suggested. It took time, but if we eventually got there. And so my stakeholders had a task, basically. And the task was to go through. I had to help them, of course, but uh, and then we had a QA engineer later on who helped uh, helped them even further so I could be offloaded and do other stuff. But that basically what is what it came down to. We feature, we went through all the features and just wrote down that if you click there, you expect that to happen. So we mapped out everything from the top level, uh, from the interface level. The reason why that is important is because now I have a way to check if I broke something. Because I now know if I'm changing a piece of code that is tied in to one of these features, I have, well, later on I got the automated tests, but now I have a way to val validate if the application is still working as intended. So that's one perspective. So now I'm, I have what we call smoke tests or something that where it's very overt things that will be caught, like in when an entire feature breaks. The other perspective is my favorite, which is the Boy Scouting rule. What is the Boy Scouting rule? Well, the Boy Scouting rule is very simple. It basically, in its essence, means that you leave the code a little bit nicer than when you picked it up or like when you started working on it. And so the way that I did it was that I created a coverage check in the central pipeline of the system so that me, myself, and all the coworkers that I had, we had a threshold saying that the coverage of unit tests is like I think if we started at 1% or something hilarious like that, it's 1% today. Next week, it should be better. And next week, the same day, I will go and I will bump that number upwards. Okay? 
and then we Boy Scout. We start work. We complete. We work as normal. We don't. You know, there's no like stories or stuff like that to just fix all the things because that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for iterative change, micro changes that are relevant to the work that we are doing. The reason why that is important is because that way. We can add a little bit on top in our estimations, on top of every story that we're going to ship. And we're still going to ship value towards the customers, but we're also going to fix things while we're doing that, which is gives us a double value. Because if you just go and arbitrarily change stuff and fix legacy and so forth, it's more likely that you're going to cause a regression in some part of the system that you're not really thinking about. and it's actually going to introduce more testing and overhead. It basically becomes a, a, a just a cost, quote unquote, just a cost. But if you're dealing with things that are actually value building or things that are uh, in focus, if that makes sense, in scope, you're already going to ship a feature, right? And if you add a little bit testing and refactors of the code that is adjacent to the thing that you're dealing with, now the box of things that you have to check is still roughly the same size. But if you change something that is completely different, then you have two things that you want to test, two areas of the code that has to be tested right. And by having that approach and just changing a tiny piece of the system bit by bit, uh, basically rewriting a little bit of the functionality, added tests on it, etc., etc., each story takes a little bit lo took a little bit longer. But that didn't matter because through using that system and then code reviews, of course, and making sure that you create quality tests, the coverage went up. And then the next week, I just bumped it again. And then we repeated that, repeated that process again and again and again. And I think it took us a few weeks, something like that. And then we were at 30% coverage. And then we went up to 50% coverage. And all of a sudden, most of the legacy was paid back. Not by one big rewrite, but by simply saying that we will make sure that you can, from this point on, not write any code without tests. And then we accept that each story right now will take a little bit longer. Because once we have the thing tested, it's usually a one-time investment. The next time, because of code that is written so poorly that it's not really testable, it has to be refactored. There's no way around it. And so that then it can be tested. But once it is in the state where it is testable, that's a one-time investment. Because no new code can come in without having tests, which means that it has to be testable by default. It's just the old stuff that has to be refactored. So what I want you to take away from this is that uh, I usually use two techniques to refactor without fear of breaking things. So one part is that I have the top level, like end-to-end -end testing, where you do like a UI-based things, which is usually just going to catch the really big stuff if something completely breaks or something like that. The other way is the Boy Scouting rule, where you just set a coverage check or something like that that forces you to add tests for all new code. And then you bump that number on a regular interval and you simply accept that each story that you work on is going to take a little bit longer because you need to add tests in order to meet your coverage requirements and those coverage requirements should be pretty sharp as sharp as you can make them if at all possible you can lower them if <clears throat> if it's like a special case or something but keep them as sharp as possible and then just continue that process because what happens is that all new code needs to be testable which means that all the adjacent code that makes that code untestable has to be rewritten until it is testable which will further increase the coverage. So it's actually, the Boy Scouting rule, guys, it is magic. It works so, so, so well. And that's all that is really needed for you to change most of like, like all your issues and so forth. You can invest in security measures, like you can invest in feature toggling and like having a good rollback strategy. So if something breaks, you can roll back to a previous version. But these two methods are the essence of how to take a complete legacy system to something really nice. And as the ending my to ending to my story, the guy who had the job before me quit, claimed that this was a shit code base. I don't know how he, get, he got that idea. He wrote the whole thing by himself. It was complete shit. Everybody was incompetent. Everything was bad. Today, this is one of the most stable and respected systems within my company. Have a great day.